Uh, no, right. What is actually 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 done is okay. Now now is when this this notion of scale space comes in. Okay, I think you know somewhere in an earlier class I did just loosely mention it, but now comes comes the idea of what is called a scale space. Okay, so the space has to do with actually you know the this an image grid and the scale has to has to actually do with sigma. Okay, so when you say scale space, I mean you can relate space to your image grid and then scale to the actual sigma rate uh, which you're going to use. So now, so now, uh, so now I now uh, now now I hope. Okay, now right, I'm going to well let me just say that oh, let me tell you what is that sigma? Sigma is r by r by root two. Okay, but this you have to show. Okay, now. Now you can actually uh, now you can actually imagine that if I had an image right where let's say you had those flowers right at various different scales and you are trying to examine it. Now clearly, if I just use one sigma and try to analyze it, what will happen? Only those blobs that fit to that sigma will 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 fire right. Nothing else will fire. So the way to do it is to actually to to keep the image of course fixed right. That's all I have, and then and then I should examine it at at various scales of my log. Right, so that is what that is why you get what is called a scale space, right? So scale space is like is like having I mean it's like having right different scales, so which which basically means that means that right I mean you you have a sigma one for this, you have a sigma two for this, you have a sigma three for this. You keep on varying varying your say sigma. So you can go from a high to low. I mean you can go from a low to high, right? So so let's say right from from a low sigma to a high sigma. And the and the idea is that right, I mean actually actually right there's a there's a lot of uh, you know what you call you know, psychophysical theory and all that has gone into this, uh, where let's say right people have proved that a Gaussian is apparently is the best right among all functions which you can think of. So if you're examining something something at let's say various different scales, what are the things that you want is what? Uh, okay, yeah, right. I mean, so I'll, I'll actually, I'll, you know, because it's not very obvious, right? What it, what it should be. So it's like this, right? I mean, if you if you are actually applying a function at different different scales, and you are examining something, you don't want new artifacts entering, right? You don't want a function that introduces artifacts, right? A Gaussian does not. So so the idea behind using scale is that you know is that you know a broader structure. So what it means is the finer structures should get suppressed, right? Because you are going to a coarser scale. Right, higher sigma means that you are examining something at a sort of you know a coarser scale, right? Because you, you are kind of right, looking at large objects, so you have a big sigma. You are actually having a big probe and you are trying to examine a blob, right? So when you go up, it's like having a coarser and coarser scale. So coarser and coarser scale, the finer guys should just uh, drop off, right? Because I mean those should those should not anymore be considered relevant. And another thing is this operator that you are using, you know, whichever function you are using to scale up and down, that should not introduce new things which were not there at an earlier scale. Right? I mean, because if something suddenly surfaces, okay, right, then there is a problem. So apparently, among the various things that you can think about, I mean, there is a lot of theory, right? I mean, you know, even uh, even that I am not an expert in that, but a lot of work has been done, and then a Gaussian is apparently the best. There is a, there's a very famous paper, Lindbergh or somebody. If you read, I think that's a 60-page paper where he analyzes the whole thing, you know. And uh, okay, the I mean, nice thing is that a Gaussian is the best, and of course, a log, right? When I mean, it comes straight from straight from that a Gaussian. So what is now done is you examine at various scales, right? So you go from a low sigma, then a higher sigma, and then you hope that uh, you know at some place something when it actually matches the scale, it'll 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 you know it'll what do you call it? no, it'll glow right in a sense. Now uh, now what what is typically done is in order to get the max, and of course you're looking at the magnitude response, okay? Because it could be a minimum, it could be a maximum. Both are okay. See, when you say a blob, right? It could also be something like you know z uh, one going to zero, or it could also be a zero. And then a one, right? Both are blobs, right? Except that in one case it will be just the opposite, the extrema. In one case it's a maximum, in another case actually is actually you know a minimum. Both are relevant for us. You know? So it's not just just this blob, right? It's also for, so something like this is also important for us, zero to one. That's also a blob for us. So both are equally relevant. In one case you will have a maxima, in another case you will have actually a minima. Therefore, what is analyzed is the strength of the scale normalized uh, normalized response. Okay, uh, to and uh, and all these operations are simply a convolution operation, right? I mean, I'm not going to be talking about how best you can implement this and so on. Right? There are very good ways to implement this, very quick ways to do this and so on. But the idea is that what you do is, you know, if you are at a point, right? If you are at a scale, right? Suppose suppose I am here and I want to check, right? Should I kind of consider this as a as an extremum or not? Then what you do is, you know, you kind of look around, look around a three cross three neighborhood. Okay, at at the scale above, one scale above, one scale below, and also also right at your own scale. So then, how many neighbors have you got? 
20, what is it, 26, right? 26 neighbors you've got. So, this guy has got, uh, say, 26 neighbors, 8 at its own scale, then 9 above it and 9 below, okay? 9 at a higher sigma, 9 at, a, at an immediately lower sigma. And, and if this turns out to be the highest, right, among all of them, then you say that, right, that this is a local extremum. And what you saw in those circles, right, is actually that that sigma. See, the important thing is, I mean, I mean, right, I mean, if I simply said that, I mean, here is an here is a point, you would be able to know at what scale, right, it was found. No, you don't know at what scale it matched. That is why you saw those circles there, right? Those circles are not really, I mean, that's that's only only indicative of the scale at which it was found to be interesting. It was a region that was found to be interesting at a certain scale. Therefore, right, if you kind of work through this scale space, then you will see that something fires at a let us say very high sigma. Then around that point, right, I mean see like I said, right, this is a space, right, and this is the scale. So, on the space you have a grid, right, where you know, where you know the xy location where it happened. But it is not enough if you simply point the location, you also have to tell at what scale was that examined, right, and that is why you, you have those circles showing up because they are telling at what sigma, right, did that fire. Right? And that is why that is how that is how you you actually right. I mean you are able to you are right. You are able to kind of uh, you know do the this one. So if you go back to this figure, right. So that's what that's what has happened here. Oh, here the equation itself is given. I think so that makes it simple for you. So so here is a butterfly example. Right? So you can see that. So you can see these blobs, right. So at some is it like high sigma or low sigma? No, see this picture, right. Before picture, then later. So, so, you are actually picking up the big blobs, right? That means your sigma should be high, right? These are the coarse guys that are, so the brightest ones are the ones that have a high response here, okay? Now, this is, okay, 26 neighbors, right? This is how you do and uh, find maxima squared Laplacian response in the scale space. So, see here, right? So, so you see so many interesting points, right? Again, I mean, you may not want to use all of them, right? You may want to finally, right? choose only a certain number of them, you can actually, you can actually do a, do a thresholding, further thresholding, but yeah, but then it, this is how it looks. So, so it is not very easy to interpret, right, I mean it is like saying that something of interest, right, has flared up, uh, has fired up and what is of interest is whatever is this operator thinks is interesting. See what, you know, the, I mean, right, nice thing about, about let us say, about, you know, a traditional way is there is still a lot of insight, right, which you can gather. Whereas in deep learning, right? I mean, as far as as far as as far as the knowledge gained is concerned, it is shallow, right? Because the network is deep, but then what we understand is very shallow. Whereas traditional is the other way around, right? It is not at all deep, but then at least the kind of the thought process that went on. In fact, there was a guy called Marr, David Marr, 